Welcome back to Nuclear Proliferation Explained. I'm William Spaniel. Today's topic is the failure of the agreed framework between North Korea and the United States. This story begins in 1992. North Korea had recently signed the Non-Proliferation Treaty and was beginning to be subjected to international inspections. Almost immediately, there was a problem. Inspectors noticed a discrepancy between the amount of plutonium that North Korea should have had and what was in its waste products at the Yongbyong facility. This was a big problem for the IAEA and the non-proliferation regime more generally. The implication, of course, was that North Korea had undeclared plutonium. And that's a problem because plutonium is one of the two materials you can use to create a nuclear weapon. To try to get to the bottom of the situation, the IAEA asked for access to a couple of other facilities within North Korea. Kim Jong-il, the leader of North Korea at the time, refused. And by March of 1993, North Korea was threatening to withdraw from the Non-Proliferation Treaty. For a while, things were in limbo. The United Nations Security Council asked North Korea to reconsider. And in a bit of a surprise, North Korea indeed suspended its withdrawal. The IAEA was briefly allowed to return, and the United States suspended its Team Spirit military exercises with South Korea. But actually ending the crisis would require something deeper. Recognizing this, the Clinton administration dispatched diplomats to engage in talks with North Korean officials. On October 21st, 1994, the parties reached what is now known as the Agreed Framework. The deal did a variety of things. For one, the reactor that North Korea was operating at the time, as well as another reactor that North Korea had under construction, were proliferation liabilities. North Korea could take plutonium from those reactors and use it to build a nuclear weapon. The first part of the deal then required North Korea to stop operating that reactor, as well as halt construction on the one that they were planning to build. Obviously, North Korea was not going to do that without getting something for itself. Its policy position was that the reactor under construction would provide electrical energy to the country, something that it desperately needed. And so if it were to stop constructing that reactor, it would need some sort of compensation. The solution was that the United States, South Korea, and other international partners would band together to build nuclear power plants inside of North Korea. The difference, though, was that these power plants would have light water reactors, like the power plant that's being constructed in the picture here. It would be easier for the international community to monitor this sort of power plant and make sure that North Korea was not siphoning off materials that could be used for a nuclear weapon. However, building power plants like this takes a lot of time. North Korea required some sort of bridge between them, and so the United States offered to send shipments of heavy oil to the country on an annual basis until the power plants were up and running. Beyond all of that, and as common with nuclear agreements more generally, the United States would take steps to normalize relations with North Korea. As you probably realize, that's not what ended up happening. So how did we go from the agreed framework in 1994 to this situation here, where the United States is now meeting with a fully realized nuclear power led by Kim Jong-un? Pretty much right after the agreed framework was signed, the 1994 midterm elections took place. It was a bloodbath for Democrats. They lost eight seats in the Senate and 54 seats in the House of Representatives. Newt Gingrich came to power as the Speaker of the House, and essentially made the agreed framework dead on arrival. By their thinking, North Korea was in a vulnerable position, and so the United States need not give those concessions to North Korea, and could instead starve out North Korea and do better for itself. Clinton tried to use executive actions to keep funds available for the agreed framework and maintain the general timeline of the deal. But the president can only do so much, and as a result, a lot of the payments were delayed. Furthermore, a central tenet of the agreed framework was that the United States and North Korea were going to have better relations. 
And certainly the message that was coming out of Congress was not matching up with that. North Korea then restarted the activities that it was supposed to stop, thereby pulling out of its end of the agreement. Things had completely fallen apart by 2002. That's when the access of evil speech occurred during the State of the Union address. And a few years after that, North Korea tested its first device and had a complete success a few years after that. Having gone through that history, I want to think a little bit about how the risk-return trade-off can help make sense out of the situation. Remember that the goal of a non-proliferation agreement is to offer just enough to a potential proliferator to make developing weapons look unattractive. This process begins by thinking about how negotiations would work out after the potential proliferator has realized nuclear weapons. The opponent then offers about that much, but can take a little bit extra for itself because the potential proliferator doesn't actually have to pay the cost to develop nuclear weapons. Here, I'm picturing a situation where a potential proliferator has relatively low cost to develop nuclear weapons. As a result, the deal in the dashed line, which would occur post-proliferation, is going to be very similar to the deal that's actually made pre-proliferation, represented by the solid line. In contrast, if the potential proliferator has high costs, then the opponent can extract a lot more out of the nuclear agreement. If you're unsure whether the opponent has high or low costs, then you face what's known as the risk-return trade-off. You can make a safe offer that will guarantee acceptance regardless of whether the potential proliferator has low or high costs, or you can make a risky offer that only a potential proliferator with high costs is willing to accept. There was a lot of noise going on with North Korea, both in terms of how resolved North Korea was to develop weapons, as well as what their actual technical capacity was. So it's not unreasonable to think that President Clinton, as well as congressional Republicans, were encountering this sort of risk-return trade-off. Based off of the way the politicians themselves were phrasing things, it seemed that the Clinton administration wanted to make a safe offer, something that was rather generous to North Korea to ensure that North Korea would comply with the deal. In contrast, congressional Republicans seemed to prefer making a riskier offer, something that would result in a very good deal for the United States if North Korea was in a position to not do any better by developing a nuclear weapon, but of course results in a higher probability of bargaining breakdown and thus a worse outcome in the long term if North Korea truly was resolved for nuclear weapons and had the technical capacity to build them. Given where we are now, we know in retrospect that North Korea had the resolve, had the internal regime stability, and had the technical ability to build nuclear weapons. The risky offer didn't actually pay off. But an interesting takeaway from the risk-return trade-off is that there is no one right offer to make when you're facing uncertainty. Instead, the optimal offer depends on your tolerance for risk. Two people facing the exact same information can want to make two different offers. If your internal preferences are such that you don't care much about the externalities of nuclear proliferation, and you do care a lot about maximizing the policy dimension at which you're in negotiations over, then it makes sense to make the risky offer. Yes, it's going to backfire some portion of the time, but if you don't care very much about the externalities, that's not that big of a deal. And if you really want to maximize the policy dimension, then that means making a risky offer, demanding a whole lot for yourself, and not giving very much to the potential proliferator. On the other hand, if you care a lot about the externalities, but don't care too much about the policy in dispute, then it makes sense to make a generous offer that is more likely to guarantee compliance. What's critical here is that it's your internal preference that's dictating your choice between the risky and the safe offer. In other words, you and I could agree 100% on what the intelligence is telling us, and yet nevertheless want to make a different offer to a potential proliferator based off of our preferences. That wraps up this lecture. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope to see you next time. Take care.